Hello everybody and welcome to another lecture of 6837. It's middle of the night again, so it's time for me to get started uh, teaching today's lecture. Uh, so today we're going to continue our discussion of rasterization, mostly by adding detail on how the Z buffer is filled in, because that's a really critical object uh, to get right during the rasterization process. And then we'll talk about some other considerations in rendering, like MIP mapping and so on, that we've already talked about in the past, but now we're going to think about them in the context specifically of rasterization. So let's get started. Before we dive into new material, I thought I'd spend a few minutes reviewing what we already know about the modern real-time graphics pipeline. I suppose I should keep adding that in here. So, right, so let's, uh, let's talk about that. So in real-time computer graphics, remember that we use rasterization instead of ray tracing often, although that could change in the future, hard to know. But in the rasterization algorithm from like 90 miles away, the big difference is that our outer loop is over triangles and our inner loop is over pixels, right? And so the basic idea is that we draw our scene by streaming one triangle at a time and painting it and filling in pixels where the pixels are on top. And the way that we figure out whether pixels are on top or not is by using this object called the Z buffer. So if we go through our real-time graphics pipeline, uh, we've already talked about how it really takes place in a number of steps. And those are written on this slide here. So the first thing that we do for each triangle is we take its vertices and we project them onto the 2D image plane. We can do that using the usual projection matrices that we've talked about many times in 6837. Then we rasterize or scan convert this triangle, which is essentially saying that given the positions of the three vertices on the screen, not in 3D, we need to figure out which pixels to light up inside of the triangle. And so if you'll recall, the basic way that we did that was by figuring out uh, the pixels that had the right sign for three different edge equations uh, of our triangle. And then we talked about different strategies to make this basic rasterization step uh, more efficient in our last lecture, for example, by doing it hierarchically or using bounding boxes. Now that we know which pixels to light up, the rest of the things that we need to do is to figure out what to put there, right? And so uh, one step is to compute per pixel color. Abstractly, this looks pretty similar to what we've already talked about in our BRDF lecture. Uh, essentially, it's exactly the same calculation, just happening in a different part of our code. And finally, uh, we need to update visibility, right? So remember that we're drawing objects one triangle at a time. So it could be that the next triangle layers on top. So in that case, we do need to draw the triangle. You know, so it could, they could stack on top of one another. Or it could be that just by accident, based on the ordering of the triangles in my 3D model, I find a triangle that's behind one that I've already rendered. In which case, I still have to rasterize it because I still need to figure out which pixels might display on the screen. But I subsequently throw away fragments that are behind the current closest thing to the camera. And I do that by checking this object called the Z buffer. Z buffer is a really critical idea for all of you guys to understand. But it's also a pretty straightforward one, right? Essentially all it's doing is in addition to keeping track of uh, the color R, G, and B of uh, the image that we're going to display on the screen, we're additionally gonna keep track of depth and essentially just reject a new fragment if it ends up behind what's at the current depth. So that leads us to a modern graphics pipeline that abstractly looks kind of like the pseudocode on the screen here. We loop over every triangle. Here's our projection. Here's how we're going to rasterize. So we need to figure out the three edge equations that are going to define the region inside of the triangle. If you are actually inside of the triangle, then you can compute the Z. If the Z buffer test passes, then finally you update your Z buffer and you do your shading. Depending on your graphics library, by the way, you, you, you might do your shading before you check your Z buffer, but of course that can be a pretty wasteful uh, computation. And you know we've already talked about uh, computing per pixel color, which is gonna happen with per, uh, pixel shaders, which we're going to talk about in more detail later. So for today, our main focus is gonna be on this last object here, the visibility test and how to update the frame buffer specifically how to update the Z buffer. That's this guy on the right-hand side, just keeping track of depth. 
Now, abstractly, it's not going to be too hard. I think many of you could come up with totally reasonable updates for a Z buffer based on essentially what we've already done in 6837. But we're going to show that you can do it in a sort of per fragment fashion, which is extremely efficient and well suited for GPU computation. So here's another reminder of what's going on. Essentially, your Z buffer is this depth map here, which is storing distance to the camera and you only update your pixel if the new Z is closer than the current Z buffer. By the way, you better remember to clear out your Z buffer when you start rendering a new frame or else uh, you're going to be in some trouble. So one detail that we haven't filled in yet in our lectures of 6837 is how to actually fill in that Z value for each pixel. Now, this sounds straightforward, and indeed, we'll see that it really isn't so difficult, but it is worth a careful discussion. And the reason is as follows. Essentially, remember our rasterization pipeline. We take the three vertices of a triangle, we project them onto the image plane, and then we rasterize that two-dimensional triangle in the image plane. So one thing that I argued, I think, two lectures to you guys ago was that and this is actually acceptable that I can take a triangle in 3D, project it onto the computer screen, and it's still a triangle, just two dimensional. Now, where that argument falls apart is that it's perfectly valid for scan conversion, but it doesn't tell you how to fill in the Z buffer, right? Because if I threw out depth altogether, for example, um, clearly I wouldn't have any way of recovering how far away each fragment is from the camera. Moreover, the reason why this ends up getting tricky is that we're using projective coordinates. So when we project our uh, pixels onto the screen, at some point we have to divide by that W value. And that can actually warp the Z in a way that we may not expect. So essentially, the step that we're going to try and fill in today is this one. And to repeat one more time to make sure that you guys understand, the key point here is that the computation where we figure out whether a pixel is inside of a triangle or not happens completely in the plane of the image. We're not using depth at all, right? We just project the vertices onto the computer screen and we do a two-dimensional calculation to figure out if a pixel is inside or outside of the triangle. So now we're in kind of a funny scenario. We have the position of a pixel on your screen in 2D and we need to work backward to that 3D triangle to figure out its depth. Now, we have to be a bit careful how we do that. Um, remember that we've talked quite a bit about barycentric interpolation, like, oh, well, if I have values associated to the three vertices of a triangle, then maybe I interpolate those values to the interior of those triangles using barycentric weighting. But now we have to be a little bit careful. In particular, there's two different triangles that are now fighting for our attention. There's the actual triangle in 3D that we're trying to render, and there's the projection of that triangle onto the computer screen. And the really frustrating thing is that even though uh, they agree up to a projection matrix, barycentric coordinates on these two objects are actually different. So we can see that using this illustration uh, on the slide here. So here we have the eye, and we're looking, I guess, sideways at a triangle. And if I draw a straight line out of my eye, that maybe bisects the uh, image here, then take a look at what happens. Essentially, the uh, farther uh, region here ends up taking up a smaller piece of the image than the closer region, even though they're equal length in 3D. And that's going to be the basic challenge. This is why barycentric coordinates actually don't agree uh, in two dimensions and three dimensions. Now, what does that mean in practice? Let's say that I had the Z value of the three projected vertices of my triangle. So to repeat that one more time, if I have a 3D triangle and I project its three vertices onto the computer screen, maybe I also compute the depth of those three vertices while I'm at it, because that, that, that can come out of that computation pretty easily. One thing I could do is say, aha, well, I have this triangle on my screen. I have its depth values like Z1, Z2, and Z3. And maybe now I'll just interpolate it to the interior of this two-dimensional triangle. 
using two-dimensional barycentric coordinates. Unfortunately, that strategy fails. So here's what that looks like. Um, in particular, on the left hand or, uh, side, we see an image just head on. And now we're going to take this square and we're going to kind of tilt it away from the camera. Now, here's what happens if I get the correct depth of the three vertices. And then in the interior of the triangle on the image plane, I just use um, barycentric coordinates to interpolate depth. And you can see that this is no good. <laughs> and so instead, to get our happy uh, interpolant here, we're going to have to introduce a new idea in 6837, which is called perspective correct interpolation. The basic idea here is that I'm operating in screen space when I rasterize these pixels. But what that means is that I can no longer use screen space barycentric coordinates to interpolate. I need to do interpolation in a fashion that is aware of that Z coordinate. So hopefully I've repeated myself enough times that you guys understand the basic issue. Basically, I can't interpolate something across the computer screen in a linear fashion and hope that it's the same as interpolating something along a surface when that surface is pointing away from the screen. So now our goal is to compensate for that. In other words, to get the interpolation weights correct so that when I'm rendering this funny shape which is pointing away from the screen, I can interpolate the, for example, the texture coordinates to the interior of a triangle uh, in a fashion that knows that there's a perspective projection there. Okay. So in order to do that, we're going to talk about barycentric coordinates even more. <laughs> so let's go back to the basics and do a tiny bit of review. Suppose that we have a triangle A comma B comma C. And here we're going to think of these three vertices as being in 3D. So that's to say that um, these are not vertices on an image, but rather in 3D space. So in 3D space, we can interpolate texture to the interior of a triangle just fine, and we view it from another angle, it doesn't matter because, well, these barycentric coordinates don't even know that I'm viewing them. They're just, you know, associated with the 3D object. As a bit of review, remember that barycentric coordinate of a point uh, can be understood uh, as follows. So if I have three vertices A, B, and C, then the barycentric coordinates of a point in the interior are basically like the ratio of the opposite triangle to that vertex uh, uh, divided by the total area of the triangle. So for example, um, alpha here would be the area of this triangle that I drew an arrow to divided by the area of the whole thing. And they basically are just describing the position of a point relative to uh, the three vertices of the triangle. And we've already talked in this class quite a bit about how general these objects are. We can use them to interpolate color, depth, all kinds of stuff. But they need to vary linearly in object space. Not in image plane space, but in the 3D space of the object. So in order to compensate for that, when we do our computations in image space during rasterization, we're going to need to use a kind of sneaky set of barycentric coordinates. Basically, the barycentric coordinates that we want are not of the pixel in the two-dimensional triangle on the screen, but rather the three-dimensional barycentric coordinates in the triangle uh, before we projected it. So uh, to give a quick summary of our mathematical derivation relative to our uh, basic strategy for rendering, during rendering process, what happens is that we have a position on the computer screen. So these are two dimensional positions, right? And those are obtained by um, scan conversion, right? So we scan converted triangle on the screen and we know a list of the fragments or the pixels inside of the triangle that we need to light up. And now what we're gonna do is work backward from these numbers to the 3D position in the 3D world that I would have been observing before I projected it, and then compute the barycentrics of that 3D point relative to the 3D triangle. <laughs> I think I've repeated myself enough times now. Now, in case that hasn't confused you enough, our derivation is actually going to do the opposite. So we're going to start 
with a 3D triangle and map it to the screen coordinates and then invert this process to get uh, our, our corrected barycentric coordinates. So let's actually just do the calculation. I think it's easier to just give it a shot rather than talk about it at a high level. Okay, so here we have a particular point in the interior of a triangle in 3D. This is in our 3D uh, triangle. And now let's say that we took our point P and we projected it onto the computer screen using a projection matrix C. Well, then what point are we gonna render? It's quite simple, it's C times P. And let's actually do a little bit of algebra. So here, of course, that's equal to C times alpha A plus beta B plus gamma C. I hope you'll all forgive me. I'm gonna get lazy about writing my vector signs today because, well, because I don't feel like it. <laughs> okay, and if we wanna continue our algebra, of course we can distribute. That's alpha C A plus beta C B plus gamma C little c. <laughs> um, and what are these things? So these are kind of like the positions of the three vertices of the triangle on the computer screen. Okay, so uh, let's give them names. So maybe we'll call them uh, alpha A prime plus beta B prime plus gamma C prime. Or through the magic of PowerPoint, <laughs> uh, here's the same expression uh, just written in nicer uh, LaTeX notation here. So to repeat, what have we done so far? We've taken a three-dimensional point in the inside of some triangle. We have uh, projected it onto the computer screen by applying our projection matrix and found that that is a linear combination of three points. So initially, it kind of seems like there's just some linear relationship that matches points on the screen to points in 3D, and that's almost true, except for one thing, which is division by W. So when we generate our fragments, they're not actually aware of W, right? The fragments are just positions on our two-dimensional image grid. But here, these A prime, B prime, and C prime may have different W coordinates for all we know. C is just a generic matrix. So from our previous slide, all I've done is reshuffled a bit. We have this nice relationship that our point on the screen is some linear combination of these three points, but that's before we homogenize. So what is the point that we actually render? Well, if we look back at our slides, we gave it a name X prime, Y prime. And what are x prime, y prime? Well, really, it's the following. It's px prime divided by pw prime, and then py prime divided by pw prime. So really, the expression that we're going to determine, um, use to determine the position on the computer screen of this uh, barycentric point in 3D has division in it, right? It looks like, uh, let's write out the first part here. So it would be like alpha AX prime plus beta um, BX prime plus gamma CX prime, all of that divided by alpha AW prime plus beta BW prime plus gamma CW prime. So here I'm just dehomogenizing this homogeneous vector P prime. And similarly for the uh, y coordinate, in fact, again, through the magic of PowerPoint, here's our expression. So this is the final dehomogenized point on the computer screen that would be the fragment corresponding to this 3D location in the interior of our triangle. Whew. I know these sentences are hard to parse, so this is the kind of thing that you might have to watch more than once or kind of sit back and think through a bit to make sure you understand the computation. So here's the key formula. Basically, P prime is equal to C times P, but we have to remember that this is before homogenization. Or hum, because I'm lazy. So what does that mean? Let's see if we can write this down in a slightly cleaner way. So in particular, 
What happens during rendering is we generate a fragment. And remember that fragment has position x prime, y prime. And we can make that position homogeneous by just sticking a one here. And the question is, what is its relationship? What's the relationship between this vector and the vector p prime, which of course is the same as p x prime, p y prime, p w prime. Well, I argue that these two things are the same up to scale, right? Because remember that at the end of the day, these are both the position on the screen of our, our fragment. And homogeneous coordinates are always the same, or the same if and only if they're uh, identical up to scaling. So we often use uh, notation for this. It kind of looks like an infinity minus uh, its uh, side. And this is just to say that uh, this first vector here is some constant times the second one. And if we want to expand it out a little bit, then of course, uh, this is a constant times uh, this expression here, right? Uh, which we can factor in uh, matrix vector notation as uh, follows. So this is uh, AX prime, BX prime, CX prime, AY prime, BY prime, CY prime, and so on. Oops, that should be W. Oh no. Times alpha, beta, gamma. So this expression is just this uh, equality written out in matrix vector notation. Okay, so now we're getting somewhere. Now we're, we're cooking with gas. Because at the end of the day, what are we looking for? Remember our goal is to compute this. This is what we want. <laughs> because this is the barycentric coordinates in 3D of the fragment that we generated on the computer screen. So um, what are we to do? So first of all, here's our, this is my, my chicken scratch, but again, thanks to PowerPoint, uh, here's a cleaned up version of the previous slide. N again, just remember that this like funny symbol here, you can read it as proportional to, to, or a different way of understanding it is, is a constant times. So this, this vector is a constant times that vector. That's the way I chose to write it on the previous slide. Okay. So if X prime Y prime one is some constant times, uh, let's call this matrix, I don't know, M alpha beta gamma. Well, what can I do? One thing I could do is multiply both sides times M inverse. And what does that tell me? Well, that tells me that alpha, beta, gamma is some other constant, really, I guess one over our constant times M inverse times X prime, Y prime one. Okay. So here I'll uh, write this uh, so we can just understand this thing as another constant. And what we get is this relationship here. So again, these are the, uh, these are the 3D barycentric coordinates. And we can obtain them, right? This is what we want. These are our smiley face coordinates. We can obtain them from the position of the fragment on the computer screen, but only up to scale. So what does that mean? That means we have two vectors. We have the vector on the right hand side, which is the one that we have, right? This is, we have all the ingredients we need to compute the right hand side. This is the one, this, so this is what we have. And the left hand side is what we want. So we're almost there. What are we missing? Well, we're missing one final useful observation. This is a really sneaky trick, uh, which is as follows, which is we know that alpha plus beta plus gamma equals one. 
This is the definition of barycentric coordinates, right? So what do we know? We know that alpha, beta, gamma is some constant. Let's call this vector, I don't know, V times V1, V2, V3. Moreover, we know that it sums to one. So all we have to do is just rescale V1, V2, to V3 to sum to one. And we know that that has to equal alpha, beta, gamma. So that is actually the end of our proof here. This is a really sneaky idea. So basically, in order to obtain barycentric coordinates in 3D, these perspective corrected barycentric coordinates, use that phrase, say that five times in a row. Well, we can obtain them by computing the right hand side here, which is proportional to what we want, and then scaling the vector so that it sums to one. So here's these steps in a nice little recipe uh, for you to take home and implement in your code. So here's what you do. If I want my perspective, persp uh, perspective corrected barycentric coordinates and I have the position of a 3D fragment, the first thing I do is I compute A prime, B prime, and C prime by taking the vertices of my triangle and projecting them onto the screen. Notice, incidentally, that I only have to do this once per triangle. I don't need to do it once per fragment. I put those guys in the columns of a matrix and I invert it, right? That inverse is right here. <laughs> then I multiply X uh, prime, Y prime one by that inverse matrix, right? That's this uh, product here. And then I take that vector and I divide it by its sum. Because a vector divided by its sum Oh no. Ah, PowerPoint hiccups for a second there. So again, uh, to repeat, I take that vector and I divide it by its sum because a vector divided by its sum is a new vector that sums to one. That's the key thing here. And now I can safely interpolate values from my three vertices of the triangle, including the depth, using these new fancy pants barycentric coordinates. Really sneaky trick. So um, there are a couple ways that we can make this calculation a little faster. For one, uh, notice that um, this matrix uh, here, and in fact, its whole inverse uh, can be computed once per triangle. Uh, so you do not have to do that matrix inversion inside of the fragment shader, which is good because the three by three matrix inverse is kind of expensive. So you do it once and then you can reuse it for all the pixels inside of the triangle. Also, you can reuse basically the same perspective corrected barycentric coordinates to interpolate not just the Z value, but also color, texture coordinates, any other information you want. Essentially, these are the correct uh, barycentric coordinates to be using when you have fragment positions on your two-dimensional screen, but they represent positions of points in a three-dimensional scene. Okay, so let's return to our rasterization pseudocode and make it a little bit more uh, sophisticated. So here, um, now what are we going to do? Well, as always, our rasterization loops over every triangle. And now we compute that fancy inverse matrix that we needed before. We can incorporate our bounding box uh, tricks from our previous lecture. And now for every pixel in the bounding box, we uh, do our scan conversion. We check if we're in the inside. We correct, we compute the barycentrics, but remember these are now the perspective corrected barycentric. And uh, finally, we can interpolate our Z from the Zs of the vertices using those pericentric uh, coordinates, and the rest of everything basically looks the same. Poof. Okay, so to me, that's one of the like trickier computations we do in this class, not because it's particularly hard, but just because it's easy to forget what you're doing in the middle and start just doing formal math. So I would strongly recommend that you guys really review that and make sure that you understand each step what the input is, what the output is, and why we're doing it.
Okay, so that addresses one of the major issues in um, rasterization, which is that we generated two-dimensional fragments, but in doing so, we kind of forgot about the 3D scene, and this is a way to reverse engineer the correct barycentric coordinates you need from the 3D scene, given the 2D fragment. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some other more advanced rasterization uh, features, and many of these kind of echo the features that we had in our ray tracer, but we just have to rethink them a little bit because now the way that we're doing our rendering has reshuffled. So one example is super sampling. As a reminder, super sampling just means essentially rendering more than one sample per pixel and averaging the result. And this is a technique for anti-aliasing. So super sampling is actually really simple in the rasterization pipeline, at least in the most basic form. So typically what we do is we just take an image, like let's say it's n by n, and we just render an image as if my screen was like two times or eight times larger. Um, your graphics card doesn't know the difference. Your monitor could be any size. And then I do a second pass over the image and just average. So we like, you know, maybe I, I render a giant image like this. Uh, but it turns out that my screen is actually only half this size. So what do I do? I, I take little groups of pixels and I average their colors in a second pass over the image, and that's extremely efficient. This is a fast way to combat the, uh, the jackies. Um, typically, we, we might jitter a little bit rather than placing all of our samples right in the center of pixels uh, to avoid those more ray patterns that we talked about before. So here's an example of what that looks like. So here's a rendering with one sample per pixel, and you can see in the background, there is lots of aliasing. It looks like noise, which is no good. If we have four samples per pixel, it starts to get blurry in the background, although there's still some aliasing. 16 is starting to look all right. With 100, it starts to look better, um, but even here, unfortunately, for example, if you look really closely in this region here, you'll still see some aliasing artifacts. And that's largely because you're, you're only pushing the aliasing problem basically into higher frequencies. But if this is all you can implement, um, then so be it. I mean, 100 samples per pixel would be a pretty high expense on your graphics card. I don't think most people do that. So one thing that we can do is we can say, well, maybe we need a lot of samples per pixel, but we don't need those samples per pixel to actually be that accurate. <laughs> This is a little bit funny, but what causes anti-aliasing? Well, let's think about a typical image. I mean, there's a bunch of different objects in an image, and often those objects really have pretty flat color. And then every once in a while, there's a very sharp transition of color from one object to the next. And those are the places that you see a lot of aliasing, right? So for example, in this image here, the reason we see aliasing in the background is that there are sharp transitions between the black and the white squares, whereas in the interiors of the squares, you know, nothing interesting is going on. So there's a related idea to super sampling, which is called multi-sampling. If you're wondering, I confuse these two all the time, and I bet you will too. <laughs> uh, and the basic idea is to leverage this fact that sharp edges are really the typical cause of aliasing in rendered images. So in the multi-sampling uh, technique, we're going to solve this problem by only doing approximate rendering. In particular, the basic problem is that if you look at the amount of computation time per fragment during rasterization, oftentimes it's spent shading that fragment. And of course, if I super sample, then with every, oops, with every new uh, super sample that I generate, I now have to do all of that shading calculation again, and that's expensive. And so our goal in multi-sampling is going to be to anti-alias edges specifically, because those are the main causes of jaggies, uh, using a lower cost. And here's going to be the trick. The idea here is that we're going to do our shading computation for each primitive once per pixel, but we're going to do our visibility computation, like the z-buffer business, at sub-pixel level. Right? So this is going to be kind of an annoying bookkeeping task, but conceptually it's pretty easy. So it's one of these things where I have, uh, my life is pretty easy teaching you guys about it, but I wouldn't want to code it. <laughs> um, so in particular, uh, it's, it's kind of a sneaky trick. What we're going to do 
is we're going to keep a big frame and a Z buffer, but really when we do our shading, we're only going to do it on the width by height frame rather than the K times width and K times height uh, object. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to take a weighted average of these approximate shading uh, values, but our averaging weights are going to be really accurate because we've resolved the Z buffer uh, and, and the um, scan uh, conversion at this finer scale. And this is going to lead us to this anti-aliasing effect with the uh, shading cost not scaling with this K value. So don't worry, I know I'm talking a lot. We're going to use a visual example to tell you what I'm talking about. So let's say that I wanted to do some sub-pixel calculations to anti-alias an image. So a typical scenario here is that maybe there are two triangles that meet uh, in uh, the interior of this pixel and I need a color that averages the color of those two triangles. So what would that look like? Something like this, right? So here there's a red triangle on the left, uh, there's a green triangle on the right, uh, and now our pixel uh, unfortunately has to decide on one color, but there's two colors present in the interior of the pixel. So in super sampling, what would we do? Well, we would compute the color of each of these subpixels one by one, and then we just average them all together to get the color of the pixel on the outside. In multi sampling, we're going to do something sneaky. We're going to say that really the pixels on the left are all just slightly different shades of red, <laughs> and the pixels on the right are all slightly sh different shades of green. And the differences between those slightly different shades, those are not actually all that significant. The reason why we're seeing aliasing is the difference between red and green. And so that's what we're going to try and resolve. So the basic idea here is to figure out during multi-sampling which of these subpixels is inside of the red triangle and which of the subsamples is inside of the green triangle, but not to compute the red and green color at each of those samples. And then to do a second pass where we compute color, but only once per pixel. So only once for this whole blue region. Now remember that the way that we do rasterization, we'll do it once per pixel per triangle because we're looping over triangles. So essentially what ends up happening is that all of these samples get the same shade of red and all of these samples get the same shade of green because the depth buffer uh, is being done at this fine scale, but the multi-sampling uh, image colors is being done at the coarse scale. So to compare, here's super sampling. You can see that all the reds and the greens have slightly different shades. Oops, here's multi-sampling. All the reds are the same. All the greens are the same. Okay. So multi-sampling is really nice because again, essentially you're doing far fewer computations because often evaluating a BRDF is quite expensive or might involve a texture lookup and all kinds of crazy stuff. So here's a super, some, some pseudocode for multi-sampling. It is extremely hard to read. I wouldn't worry about it a lot. <laughs> I would just try and think about it in terms of what's different from the basic rasterization algorithm. And I'll admit that multi-sampling is one of these techniques that's taken me a few years to make my peace with and really understand. So if you're not quite following, you're in good company, but do spend some time thinking about it after this lecture. So, so far, this is uh, looking an awful lot like the uh, rasterization algorithm we know and love, where we iterate over our pixels inside of the triangle and shade them. But now, Inside of a pixel, we'll have a bunch of subpixels. And for each subpixel sample, that's when we're going to do things like scan conversion, like figure out which ones are inside of the triangle and which ones aren't, and uh, deal with the Z buffer. And here's the sneaky trick. The color at each subpixel sample that is on the top of the Z value is obtained by the shading, but remember, the shading is not done per subpixel, it's done for the whole pixel all in one shot. So all of those red um, things end up with the same shade of red instead of slightly different ones. Now, one thing you might notice is that our frame buffer is k times larger than it should be, so at display time we have to do a second pass over our image and average those subsample values, which is pretty typical. <laughs> 
So to compare uh, multi-sampling and super-sampling, super-sampling just computes a larger image and then averages it down to the right size. Multi-sampling does that for visibility, but still does its shading once per pixel to eliminate some of the computation that you would have to do otherwise. So this is a nice trick. I think it's implemented in many of the major graphics uh, libraries right now. Um, and perceptually, it tends not to make a huge difference, even though uh, you can save quite a bit of computation uh, during the, the rendering pipeline. So as a bit of a reminder, we already talked about many different species of aliasing. So multi-sampling is largely a strategy for avoiding edge aliasing. So like when two different triangles uh, are touching next to each other or when there's um, a sharp transition in depth in your image. Another major source of aliasing comes from texturing because remember uh, from our lecture on um, aliasing and mip mapping, it's very rare that your two-dimensional texture that you stored just happens to be the same size as what you want to display in your 3D scene. So instead, we're often stuck doing two related tasks. One is magnification, where I get really, really close to my 3D texture. The other is minification, where I have a textured object is very far away from the camera, and I need to somehow blur out my texture before I draw the shape. Hopefully this is a review by now. If it's not, I might recommend that you guys revisit the anti-aliasing lecture. So texture aliasing is a huge problem in real-time 3D graphics, and it's very difficult to resolve, but there are some standard techniques that people use to help uh, improve the situation. So the basic strategy, which we've already covered, is basically uh, to use a, a MIP map. But this is a little bit tricky uh, because, you know, uh, when we do pre-filtering, um, we need to know exactly where the camera was, what uh, the uh, angle is, and so on. And so, of course, uh, one of the, the, the big challenges here is that when we do our texture filter, what we'd really like to do is do some kind of a filter on the texture because that's something that we could pre-compute, like a MIP map. But uh, the anti-aliasing, that actually needs to happen in screen space. Uh, so remember, like, think about that, that checkerboard pattern going off into infinity. The checkers are the same size, regardless of whether they're close or far to the camera. What's causing the aliasing is the fact that your pixels on your screen are evenly spaced. So that's to say that your texture filtering in an ideal universe needs to happen on the screen. The only problem is that objects like mid maps are associated to the texture itself. So we're going to do all kinds of sneaky tricks to get around this basic headache. Essentially, we're going to combine some low pass filtering, like blurring stuff out on the texture image with sampling uh, to get an efficient algorithm. Uh, and this is going to lead us to a technique that we'll call pre filtering. The basic reason, again, as I, I've already stated, is that the filter we'd like to do is on the image, but that's too expensive. So instead, we're going to think about taking the filter that we'd like to apply on the image plane and basically push it forward to the texture uh, image instead. Now, we're going to need a little bit of calculus in order to do that. I'm really sorry, but just a little bit. So again, our goal is to take a nice isotropic filter on your screen. Remember, we talked about how sync is the best possible one. And instead, do that filtering here. In calculus, we would call that a change of variables. So indeed, we can do that. And here's our formula. So what are we doing? Well, we've computed exactly the same weighted average as before, right? This is an integral over the screen that's trying to blur out your pixels. That's what we want to do in anti-aliasing. And now by doing just the change of variables formula in calculus, I can do that integral over the plane of our 3D shape instead. And when I do that, I incur a factor, hopefully this is review from calculus class, that looks like the derivative of the map from the screen into the 3D surface. So if you look at this formula, it's still some kind of weighted average. It's just that the weights changed. 
because now they're uh, basically modulated by this J factor here. So what does that look like visually? Here's the basic challenge once again, um, that again, when we want to do anti-aliasing, we're trying to compute integrals or weighted averages on the image plane. If we take that circle where we're doing our weighted average and view it on our 3D domain, it no longer looks like a circle. And so essentially that's a big challenge for texture pre-filtering because in real-time computer graphics, we're gonna keep moving our camera around. And so we can't necessarily pre-filter that texture image for every possible camera angle. But we're gonna try. Our solution is still gonna to be to do pre-computation. So let's say that we have this brick wall uh, texture here. Well, one thing that we've already talked about that we can definitely do is compute a MIP map, which essentially is like computing a blurred out version at different scales. Right? So this is like applying a low pass filter. And because we've done low pass filter, we can subsample, we can make it smaller without losing much information. We can divide it in half and so on. And that leads us to this object called a MIP map. So as a tiny bit of review, a MIP map is just where you take a texture, you store a texture that's half as big, a texture that's an eighth as big, and so on. A quarter, I guess, is in there somewhere. <laughs> but here's the basic challenge. Well, if we think about the previous couple slides, if I take a region at some MIP level and I look at what it corresponds to in the other MIP levels, they're always circles, but that's not the picture that we see here, right? We'd like to integrate over ellipses and that's where things get challenging. So, right, what can we do? Well, the simplest thing to do is to just ignore that phenomenon altogether. So maybe we ignore the fact that there's foreshortening, but at the very least, we choose the radius of this circle kind of based on the depth from the camera. That would be the sort of zeroth order approximation. Um, and that's actually what old school computer graphics people often did. And so this is the idea that you choose the right MIP level <laughs> um, to correspond to the uh, filter uh, on the computer screen. So one simple method for doing that would be to essentially uh, right, choose the uh, MIP level that's sort of roughly similar to the spacing between your pixels. And then you still have to do some bilinear interpolation because you're very unlikely to end up at the corners of the pixels. But uh, that can create a problem. So let's say that I'm watching that scene with, uh, what is it, the Hulk, you know, is walking away from the camera. There's a dramatic violin, music, whatever. And so the Hulk walks far enough away from the camera that suddenly his texture is starting to look aliased and I want to move to a different MIP level. What's going to happen? Well, suddenly, you know, the Hulk is going to get far enough from the camera and there's a break in time where your graphic system decides he needs to be uh, drawn with a different MIP level. And this is actually very noticeable discontinuity in time because suddenly he becomes blurry. <laughs> That's not so great. Um, so a typical thing to do is to choose the two closest MIP levels, do the same calculation on both and interpolate between them in a smooth way. This is called trilinear MIP mapping. Why is it trilinear? It's bilinear in the image plane. And then the third linear is given by uh, interpolating between the MIP levels. And at the very least, that doesn't have this snapping effect. As you walk away from the camera, you get gradually more blurry and there's a graceful handoff from one MIP level to the next. So here's uh, an example of what that looks like. So on the top, we have the worst possible aliased image on the bottom using this trilinear MIP mapping you already do pretty well. Um, these are just isotropic. There's no fancy uh, squashed uh, circles going on here. And already in the background, most of the aliasing is gone. So this is, uh, this is good news. It means that maybe we can ignore that Jacobian term a little bit. As a side note, uh, remember we already talked a bit uh, about uh, how MIP maps actually, you can store them using just a third more space than the original texture image, which is pretty cool. And that's just a result of the fact that we've got like one plus one fourth plus one sixteen plus dot dot dot. There's some geometric uh, series that's really going on here. In fact, there's a really clever trick for tiling the red, green, and blue so that your whole uh, map image just sits in one giant square. I always thought that was really clever. <laughs> <laughs>
But of course, our filter really isn't circular because of foreshortening, right? When you take uh, your texture and I face it away from the camera, now I really should be integrating over ellipses rather than circles. And we can't pre-compute the integral over every possible ellipse. We can't pre-filter our image under every possible warp that you're going to see. So what do we do in practice? Well, typically, um, one strategy that you might use is something called anisotropic filtering. So the basic idea here is that I can use MIT maps to integrate over circles. So one thing I can do is to try and compute that ellipse on my screen. And now I'm going to just approximate that by averaging <laughs> five circular integrals. Um, and for each one using that trilinear lookup we talked about. This is a lot of computation and a lot of lookups, but your graphics hardware is pretty tuned to do that lookup really quickly. So this is actually recommended. I think this is the easiest thing that you can implement. Essentially what you're doing is approximating your elliptical filter with a bunch of circles. Usually five is the magic number, but you know, you know that's kind of a random thing to say. So the one last detail that we haven't filled in here is how to actually choose the correct MIP level. And essentially the idea here is that we can kind of think of our filter like a box, but we need to know the size of our box in order to figure out the right MIP map level to choose, right? Obviously, if our box, like this is our projected pixel on, uh, you know, this is the pixel from the computer screen projected onto the texture, then I want a weighted average about this whole space, then this texture is clearly far too large uh, for the MIP computation that we want to do. So really, how can we do this? How can we compute? the kind of aspect ratio of this yellow rectangle here? Well, here's one sneaky trick. Really, it has to do with the derivative of the 3D point as a function, or the derivative of depth as a function of your position on your computer screen. And so uh, what can we do? Well, here, Px and Py, these are the projection of the uh, pixel onto the uh, the texture image. And so what we can do is take, uh, aren't that, is that Px and Py? Well, I guess Px and Py here, um, I'm sorry, are, are really the derivatives. Um, so here is the pixel center, right? This is the thing that we're going to render eventually. And we're trying to figure out the size of this box. So my apologies, Px and Py are these two vectors here. Oof. And how can we get them? Well, we can essentially differentiate with respect to the screen position, the position of your texture coordinate. So the, the point here uh, is that uh, you can think of this point on your texture as u comma v. And of course, at the end of the day, you're gonna draw this on your computer screen. You know, like here's your eye looking into the screen. And these coordinates are x, y. And the derivative of one in terms of the other is what's giving you the size of the rectangle. Sorry for taking a minute to talk around that. <laughs> so what does that mean? Well, what that means is that we'd really like the derivative of u and v with respect to x and y. Now, for isotropic linear map mapping, let's say that I have that derivative. There's still not a perfect solution to which MIP level to choose um, because well, your MIP maps are circular, but this is obviously not a circular shape. I've listed some heuristics on the slide. I wouldn't worry about it a whole lot. This is the kind of thing you Google it when you need it. Um, or you can, you know, send different ones out, maybe weight them from a Gaussian. These are all just different um, heuristics. I don't think they're worth covering in detail. Instead, uh, one thing that is worth noting is we need to figure out how to compute these these darn things. <laughs> so again, despite a little bit of uh, talking in circles here, uh, the basic point is that X and Y are positions on your screen. U and V are positions in the texture map. After composing, you know, compute the point on the triangle, map it to the texture. And that the derivative of this is what's basically determining the step in your, um, uh, your MIP map that you need to worry about. So to actually compute these partials, you can do them in one of two ways. Um, you can actually compute closed form formulas based on like the positions of the triangle vertices and so on. And this is what used to be done. These days, 
your computer screen is really big. <laughs> uh, your pixels are pretty densely sampled. So rather than doing that, you know, remember that like D, uh, what, D, U, D, X is roughly equal to, you know, U at X plus one Y or maybe H minus U of X, Y divided by H. So, well, you already have the texture coordinates on all your pixels anyway. Um, you can just use this uh, uh, divided difference formula to give some approximation, and that seems to work out okay. Whew. So I think I've managed to make a little bit of a hash of that content. I do encourage you to all uh, review it a bit, and of course you can ask as many questions as you want. But at the end of the day, if you just want to see some examples, so on the left-hand side is the image we had before with trilinear mip mapping. And now we're kind of looking at this plane at kind of a weird skew angle where circular convolution really isn't correct for anti-aliasing. And you can see that if you use all these tricks that we've been talking about, the aliasing looks really pretty minimal, even as you go pretty far back into the scene. So these are advanced topics. You're not going to implement them in 6.8.3.7, but they are worth being aware of. The basic point here is that rasterization really cares about efficiency. Anti-aliasing is a typical source of inefficiency <laughs> because we need to render lots of subpixels. And so there's many strategies uh, for getting around that, right? And so mip mapping is one of them. The basic challenge here is that your mip map is usually isotropic, right? It's scaling evenly in all directions. So you need to do two things. One is account for that anisotropy. We did that by averaging multiple samples from our MIP map. And the second thing that we need to do uh, is to figure out which MIP level to choose for all those samples. And we can do that with this, this gradient trick. So there's all kinds of further reading on these things. If you pick up any graphics textbook, you can find a lot. I personally, I find them to be kind of nice to be aware of, but definitely implementation details, but important ones at that. Um, so I've included some pointers. Uh, one kind of amazing thing is that uh, Paul Heckbert's uh, master's thesis was actually one of the sort of seminal works in this area. Um, so for those of you who are starting your MNG, uh, <laughs> let that be a standard for you. Okay. So let's do a little bit of review. So as a reminder, we've essentially covered two re uh, rendering algorithms in this course. One is ray casting slash ray tracing. The other is rasterization. And that the two basic changes that happen are just swapping two lines of code. And that there's a nice trade-off between these two strategies, right? So in ray casting, I need to keep the whole scene in memory. If there's all kinds of acceleration tricks I need to do to make it tractable at all, but it's quite general. I can simulate rays bouncing every which way. In rasterization, it's very hard to get effects like global illumination, but it's also very efficient. Um, the one time where efficiency can break down is when you have overdraw, which remember is when you produce many, many fragments per pixel. So your graphics hardware is really tuned for rasterization. So the way that your graphics hardware works is that it's really good at calculations that fall into a particular category known as SIMD. SIMD stands for single instruction multiple pair, uh, oh boy, single instruction multiple data. And the basic idea is that, for example, let's say I'm evaluating a BRDF, it's exactly the same function that I have to evaluate on a bunch of different pixels. The only difference is the input to that function. So this is known as a data parallel task. This is different than task parallelism, which is what you often learn in parallel computing class when you're just starting out. So task parallelism would be like what's going on in your laptop where you're watching Zoom, but you're also surfing the internet and it's running your operating system. And these are all very different tasks happening at the same time. This would be known as multiple instruction, multiple data. But this just doesn't appear quite as much in your graphics card. So later on in this course, we're going to talk more about the hardware architectures that allow you to do SIMD. But for now, I think it's enough to just think a little abstractly that your, your, your graphics card is really good at data parallelism. And that's inspired by um, the fact that the rasterization algorithm is really built on that kind of reasoning. 
So let's go back through the different applications of graphics we had at the beginning of this course and try to categorize them a little bit. In particular, uh, we can try and categorize them as this data parallel high throughput rasterization algorithm or this task uh, parallel um, ray tracing algorithm. Right, so by the way, this is usually using your graphics card. This is usually using your CPU. By the way, all of these are extreme simplifications, and I'm sure my colleagues in hardware architecture would be very upset with me if they knew what I was teaching in this course. In any event, let's start with movies. So when we do rendering for movies, actually, this is a big combination of rasterization and ray tracing, which is kind of interesting. Um, movie scenes often are composited together, like... Uh, Probably Jurassic Park is the easiest one to see, but even in animated films, um, multi-pass rendering is pretty typical. So rather than like just one beautiful ray tracing thing done in one time, maybe you keep an environment map around and you do one character at a time or you're trying to insert a character in a film scene and what have you. Um, different studios and different uh, scenes basically demand um, some combination of rasterization and ray tracing for this particular task. Most games employ rasterization. This is slowly changing. There are some ray traced games out there. Um, I think they're mostly just cool demos. Um, or similarly to the, the movie uh, setup, one thing that you can do is rasterize the bulk of your scene but then if there's like one interesting shiny refractive object or something maybe you ray trace just that one object um combining rasterization and ray tracing is feasible but of course it requires a lot of really careful reasoning about how you engineer your rendering algorithm simulation for basically similar reasons oops uh, i included the wrong images uh, also typically uses rasterization computer-aided design is a really interesting one where rasterization happens for the interaction, right? Like as I'm designing my 3D model, I typically am interacting with it um, by using rasterization tools that give me quick feedback. And then for the final image where I want to make these cool product images that are shiny and reflective and so on, then anything goes, right? Then I can use ray tracing. In architecture applications, um, we often do ray tracing uh, this makes sense because architecture, you really care about exactly where the light is going, what the scene is looking like, or maybe even if the light is going to heat up your universe. Um, so this is an area where essentially ray tracing makes a lot of sense. Still, the efficiency of ray tracing is really low, especially in these global illumination style scenes. One thing folks might do is a little bit of pre-processing. So... You can do rasterization with some ray tracing to maybe do something similar to global illumination. Virtual reality is almost all rasterization currently because it needs to be super fast and responsive. I think you're all seeing the pattern now. Visualization is some combination thereof. And similarly for medical imaging, although I think medical imaging the graphics in the medical tools tend to be kind of lame. Uh, so I think many of them are probably still rasterized. So there are many other challenges when developing rasterization algorithms, and we're going to continue to talk about them in this course. We're not quite done yet. Um, some of the big ones include transparency, shadows, reflections. It's not so clear how to handle those in the algorithm that I've set up for you so far. And there's also some cool tricks that can help uh, improve some aspects of rasterization by modifying the basic algorithm. These are things like uh, deferred shading, so let's talk about these just at a high level so you get some idea. So one of the basic challenges in rasterization is to deal with transparent objects like windows. And if you think about it, that really makes sense. Um, in particular, remember that we use this Z buffer object. So here's the basic challenge. What Z buffer value do I put when there's a window? <laughs> well, the answer is probably none, <laughs> right? I probably ignore the Z buffer altogether. But if I have an opaque object sitting in front of my window, then I do want to get in front of the window. So it's not just a question of scaling the colors anytime you find a window pixel. So this is all really challenging. Um, basically dealing with transparent objects 
isn't super compatible with the Z buffer as we've described it. Um, so there are different tricks that people use. So for example, um, one solution which is complicated, but if you really want that window to come out right, maybe you um, is actually store multiple depth values per pixel. Um, so I've included a link to one uh, technique that does that. Uh, a different thing that you might do is render all of the transparent objects in a second pass at the very end so that you have an accurate Z buffer that can tell you, does something get in the way of my transparent object? But you don't have to worry about, does my transparent object get in the way of something else? <laughs> a different challenge kind of related to multi-sampling is just that Doing your shading calculation, like evaluating your BRDF, is often quite expensive. So in the current algorithm that I've described for you all, sometimes we evaluate our BRDF and then we don't use it, right? We generate a fragment. It's currently the one that's on top, thanks to the Z buffer. We do our computation, but then we stream in a new triangle and it just gets covered up. So one strategy here is something called deferred shading. Deferred is the keyword. So this, as with many of the strategies that I've been talking about, is a multi-pass uh, rendering technique, which means that you have to stream all the triangles more than once. So in deferred shading, it's kind of sneaky, what you do is in a first pass through all your triangles, you rasterize them, you maybe store their normals, and then uh, in the second pass, you pass over the object and then you do your, your, your shading uh, computation. Related to deferred shading is the idea of doing a pre-Z pass here. Um, so here, uh, we actually do a second pass where we rasterize all the triangles a second time. So in deferred shading, we're just going to rasterize all the information we need for shading and then do shading in one shot. In the pre-Z pass approach, we actually don't rasterize any information at all except for just the Z buffer. So the basic idea here is that in our first pass, we're going to compute the correct Z buffer for our scene, but not compute any color at all. And now in the second pass, we'll do all that rasterization again. But now we know that if we're on the top of the Z buffer, we really should do our shading. So there's not going to be a scenario where later on some other triangle might cover stuff up. So the advantage here is it's like really easy to implement, but you have to rasterize everything twice. Another technique that's being that's worth being aware of is tile-based rendering. So one challenge you might have is that your buffer might be too small if you do anti-aliasing. These days your graphics card probably has a stupid amount of memory and it's not a concern. But on your phone, it might be. Very <sighs> easily. So one thing you could do um, is to render subsets of the screen at one time. So what you might do is to divide up your screen into like big pixel-like objects and then apply your rasterization algorithm to each tile at a time. So what that, what could that allow you to do? Well, one thing is, for instance, let's say I want to actually rasterize something that's 10 times bigger than this tile and use that for anti-aliasing. Well, that might take up all my memory, so I'm going to do that anti-alias and then store the anti-alias result before moving on to the next tile. That can actually slow down your rasterization quite a bit because now you have to stream through all of your triangles for each tile, but it can be useful in mobile uh, graphics card. So these are just a few kind of Google search terms so that you guys start thinking about all the different challenges that appear in the rasterization algorithm because there are many. So as a quick recap of today's lecture, Essentially, the high-level point and the, the main thing that I want you to get out is, is, is mostly the computation we did toward the beginning, which is that if you want to do perspective-corrected interpolation, you cannot use barycentric coordinates from your computer screen, but rather you have to do that kind of careful consideration uh, that we did at the beginning of class. And so the basic point here is that we generated our fragments you know, we, we uh, you did scan conversion completely on the two-dimensional computer screen. And then we reverse engineered for each fragment what the barycentric coordinates in 3D that would have been for that fragment before it was projected. And that's where that matrix inverse came from. For anti-aliasing, 
plus rasterization, we talked about two different strategies. One is super sampling, which is super easy, right? That's just like double the size of your image, rasterize, and then shrink. And multi sampling, where you do your depth buffer and that kind of stuff at high detail, but your shading at low detail. And for anti aliasing textures, we talked about uh, how to use mint maps, and in particular, that we might need to sample them more than once to get this anisotropic effect. Then finally, we just mentioned a grab bag of other specialized methods that can reduce the computational effort in uh, rasterization while adding some of the effects that we care about in our scene. So with that, we've covered a lot of the basic tricks in rasterization, and we'll continue next time with uh, even more.